Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Network 2020's discussion on Ethiopia and Tigray and why the conflict matters for the Horn of Africa and, um, and actually, indeed, the world. So, um, so thank you all for, for joining us. We're very lucky to have two excellent experts with us today. Um, before I introduce them, I will just say a few words about Network 2020 for those of you who don't know. So we are a nonprofit organization based in New York and we're really um, focused on bridging the gap between the private sector and the foreign policy worlds. And we, um, we leverage entrepreneurial established and emerging leaders um, to drive innovative research and solutions critical to impacting foreign policy challenges. So that means a number of different things. We run educational programs like this virtual briefing series, as well as on the ground research um, and, uh, and other programs as well. So please take a look at our website and follow us on all those social media as well. Um, it's a great honor to introduce our speakers today. Uh, first, we have Ambassador David Shin. Um, he is a professor at the George Washington University, but notably he spent a nearly four decade career in the Foreign Service, um, largely looking at the Horn of Africa and has um, all the credentials that go along with it. Um, I'm going to be very concise about the bios in order to leave more, more time for the discussion, but um, needless to say, we're very lucky to have someone with his expertise. Um, and in addition, we also have Professor Alex DeWall, who's the Executive Director at the World Peace Foundation at the Fletcher School at Tufts. Um, and he has done a lot of research in the area as well. Um, and has been working in the in, in the region for decades. Um, I do want to say that we did make a lot of effort to try to find someone who could speak to us from the ground, um, but the, be, due to a lot of political sensitivities, we really weren't able to do that. Um, but we're very lucky to have both Ambassador Shin and Professor DeWall who are very connected and can relay some of the messages of what they're hearing as well. Um, we're also fortunate to have uh, Joanna Vostroski to moderate this conversation conversation. She's a long-term Network 2020 member um, and is has done work in numerous aspects of foreign policy over the years, and so she will be guiding us through this conversation. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Joanna, with a big thanks to Ambassador Shin and Professor DeWall. Thank you so much, Courtney. So today we will be discussing with our panelists the role of Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa and specifically the crisis in its Tigray region. We will explore the roots of the conflict, what is happening on the ground, what are likely outcomes, and how the conflict could impact Ethiopia's neighbors. In 2018, Prime Minister Abiy was celebrated for signing a peace agreement with Eritrea, ending a 20-year border war, and for releasing prisoners. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019, and there was great hope both within and outside of Ethiopia that positive developments were coming to the country. Abiy was hailed as a reformist, steering Ethiopia away from ethnic strife and dictatorial rule towards a new democratic era. But in 2020, everything seemed to change with opposition leaders being arrested in international elections and a government-led military incursion into Tigray. So the question is, what happened? So I'd like to turn to you first, Ambassador Shin. For background, could you please provide a very brief history of the region and Ethiopia's role in that history and how that history has led to the current crisis in Tigray? Sure, happy to do that, Joanna. I'm going to pick it up in 1974 and, and very quickly uh, bring it up to the future. 1974 was the end of the imperial government in Ethiopia where Emperor Haile Selassie was overthrown by a military junta. The US had very close relations uh, with Haile Selassie, it was replaced uh, by Mengistu Haile Mariam eventually, who was in charge of the military group. Uh, Mengistu was a very, had a, led a very left-wing government had uh, very poor relations with the United States, very warm relations with the Soviet Union. And that uh, continued uh, pretty much throughout his reign until uh, 1991 when he was overthrown. But before getting to 1991, you had uh, a couple of significant developments internally, mainly a war of independence by the province of then Eritrea uh, against the government uh, in Ethiopia, 
and you had a major opposition group developed in Tigray region uh, called the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF. Together, the, uh, the opposition in Eritrea and the, the TPLF uh, with some other groups like the Oromo Liberation Front managed to topple the Meng left-wing Mengistu government in 1991. Uh, he went into exile in Zimbabwe uh, was replaced by, in 1991 by the Eritrean People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, the EPRDF, a coalition group, uh, which was really led by the TPLF, but it had other important members. Uh, and the primary leader in that group was Melis Zanawe, who became prime minister. The, uh, the EPRDF agreed at the outset to grant independence uh, to, uh, to Eritrea, which held a referendum two years later and voted overwhelmingly for independence, which made Ethiopia a landlocked country. Uh, it looked like relations between Ethiopia and Eritrea were going to continue on a good track initially, and they did, but eventually some problems began to develop and they ultimately resulted in a, in a conflict uh, along the border between Ethiopia and Eritrea in 1998, that lasted in a two-year war, very nasty war with uh, up uh, almost uh, 100,000 soldiers killed in that, uh, in that conflict. Uh, eventually, the war came to an end, but you had a continuation of essentially a Cold War uh, with no diplomatic relations between the two countries. In the meantime, Ethiopia had a series of elections. The only one that was really meaningful was 2005. The others were, by and large, meaningless elections. Uh, Melizanawi, the leader, died of natural causes in 2012. Uh, you had a, a new uh, civilian government come into place, and then yet another one in 2018, led by Abiy uh, Ahmed, the current uh, prime minister of Ethiopia. Uh, you had uh, the TPLF uh, sort of pulling back its power just into Tigray region. They realized that they were on the outs uh, with the new uh, government led by Abiy Ahmed. They held separate elections in Tigray uh, in uh, September of uh, 2020. The elections were won by the TPLF and were followed uh, in a couple of months later in November by an attack on the uh, government's northern command in Mekele, the capital of Tigray by uh, the TPLF. Uh, and that was sort of the, uh, the spark that began the current war that, uh, that broke out and is still continuing as a guerrilla conflict today. And I'll stop it there. Uh, that sort of covers a lot of history in a very brief period of time, but uh, I think that brings us up to the present. Great, well, thank you so much. So um, Alex, uh, if I could ask you, what is the current situation in Tigray and what factors have led to the humanitarian crisis in the, in the area? So as um, Ambassador Shin uh, pointed out, uh, a war broke out in, in, in November. Prime Minister Abbey promised this would be a very short war. Um, he said 10 days to a few weeks. And the first phase was indeed very swift. There was a, a, a joint offensive by the Ethiopian um, Defense Forces and the Eritrean Defense Forces that captured the, the, the major city, Makele. And any war of this type, any conflict of this type, will disrupt food security. And Ethiopia, as we all know, had a terrible famine back in the 1980s. And when the EPRDF came to power in 1991, in his very first press conference, Mela Zanawi was asked, you know, what was his ambition for his time in power? And he said, Ethiopians should, meet, should eat three meals a day. And for all its many failings, the EPRDF government actually achieved that. So that six years ago, there was a, a major drought in the country, 20 million people in need of, of, of food assistance. And the then deputy prime minister, a man called Demeke McConnell, as uh, 
as part of the EPRDF led what was an extraordinarily effective uh, emergency relief response, 70% of which was funded by the Ethiopians themselves. So we had a, a food crisis on a scale bigger than anywhere else in Africa that was successfully managed. And at the onset of the, the conflict seven months ago, Ethiopia as a whole and Tigray in particular were food secure. This entire very sophisticated system was intact. It was comprehensively dismantled. It was disrupted by the war, but the key factor was a campaign of starvation crimes committed by the government forces, by the Eritreans and by the militia from neighboring Amhara region that overran substantial parts of, 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 of the Tigray region, parts that were contested. And there are reasons why one can say this land belongs to this side or that side. But the manner in which the Tigrayan population was driven from those areas generated a humanitarian crisis. So we have the crimes of, of pillage, massive looting, dismantling universities, ransacking factories, farms, shops, hotels. We have the war crime of starvation, which is de defined under the Rome Statute of the ICC as destroying or rendering useless objects indispensable for survival. So this includes food. It also includes water. It also includes medical facilities, something like 70% of the medical facilities were either ransacked or vandalized, and only less than 15% now are actually fully functional. Crops have been burned, you know, livestock have been slaughtered. Troops are going out into the villages and telling farmers, you will not plow, you will not cultivate, you will not harvest, we will punish you if you do. And, 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 and so starvation is, is not just a byproduct of the war, it is actually the chief weapon that is being used um, in this war. And another object indispensable to survival for children is maternal care. And we are seeing a, a massive amount of rape and sexual violence. And a survivor of rape is unable to care for herself properly or her children. And we have tens of thousands of unaccompanied children whose mothers are either in captivity, held as sexual slaves by the forces, or are recovering in hospital or in, in, in um, safe houses, or we simply don't know where they are. And even those mothers who have survived, imagine the anguish of knowing that their young children are not properly being cared for. They don't know where they are. So we have these starvation crimes. I think we might have frozen here. Uh, so while we uh, while we try to um get Alex back online if I can uh, if I can uh, speak to you um, Ambassador Shin. Um, we, Ethiopia faces additional challenges as we know in the region. We, we just spoke of Tigray but there are disagreements with Egypt and Sudan over the Grand Renaissance Dam and, and a border dispute with Sudan. Can you um, please uh, discuss what impact these issues have um, moving forward for Ethiopia and for the Horn of Africa in general? Sure. The, uh, the issue of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is, is totally separate from what is going on in Tigray, although it's a very important issue. The Sudan-Ethiopia border problem is directly related to the situation in Tigray. The, the dam that we're talking about is on the Blue Nile. Uh, it's about 75% completed. When uh, finished, it, will, it would be the largest hydropower dam in all of Africa. Uh, so it does have a, a significant impact upon the whole Nile water question, uh, but it only provides hydropower. It's not an irrigation type dam. Uh, once it, the reservoir is filled behind the dam, the water continues to flow to downstream countries, Sudan and uh, Egypt. And of course, Egypt is totally dependent upon the Nile River for about 95% of all of its water supply. So it's a critical issue for Egypt. 
the, the disagreement is that the Egyptians and to some extent the Sudanese uh, don't want anyone upstream tampering, tampering with the water. Uh, they want basically to control it entirely. The Ethiopians say, look, the water, most of the water originates in Ethiopia. Don't we have a right to use some of it at a minimum to produce electricity? Uh, and as a result, this is one issue on which almost all Ethiopians are in agreement, uh, which is a pretty rare event in Ethiopia today. There's so much disagreement on so many other things in the country, but they all agree that the dam should go forward and Ethiopia has a right to the water. Uh, the problem is that uh, the three countries are trying to work out an agreement uh, basically orchestrated by the African Union to, to agree as to how to go forward with the filling of the reservoir behind the, uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and then how much water to release from it on an annual basis once it is filled. And that's where the, uh, the whole issue is stuck today. The border issue is more straightforward. It's a longstanding issue that has come to the fore as a result of the conflict in Tigray, uh, in part because you've had 65,000 Tigrayan refugees move into Sudan close to the area where the border is in dispute. But it's a, it's a border uh, dispute concerning um, Ethiopian farmers who have moved into an area that Sudan has long claimed and may have good claim to. Uh, and the two countries have now brought it into their conflict uh, over the, uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam dispute. In other words, Sudan is using it as a lever uh, to, uh, to try to uh, gain some uh, advantage in the, uh, in the dispute over the water, Nile waters question. All right, thank you so much. So I see we, we have Alex back again. Apologies. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you could please continue your, uh, your thoughts. So I'm not quite sure where I got cut off. I was explaining that the, 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 the famine was brought about by a whole series of starvation mm -hmm. crimes. And that, the, that the, what the situation we have at the moment is that the humanitarian access, there are about 5 million people in need. Um, and in what the UN would classify as emergency, which is one step short of famine, about 350,000 minimum in, in famine conditions, which means I'm afraid that um, it's really too late to save the lives of several tens of thousands of, of, of children. Two thirds of those who perish will be children, um, whatever happens. Um, and in order to, to avoid a famine on the scale of what happened in the 1980s, which cost about a million lives, much more substantial effort um, is, is required. Um, there was a call by the Biden administration and the G7 um, over the last week or so for a humanitarian ceasefire. And none of the parties, none of the four belligerents, the Ethiopian government, the Eritrean government, the Amhara forces, or the Tigrayan resistance have said yes to this. Um, and in fact, the fighting has, 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 has intensified. So, those in, in, in the US administration and, and the European Union who, who, who are seeking a, an effective response to this enormous humanitarian crisis are, are really quite stuck. The UN Security Council has, seven months into the conflict, has not had a proper full public session on this. It has not invoked either of the two mechanisms that it might, a threat to international peace and security, or um, Resolution 2417, which is about armed conflict and hunger, saying this is a, a humanitarian emergency worthy of, a, of our attention. The reason for that inaction at the UN Security Council, which in my view is scandalous, is threats of veto by China and Russia, and the fact that the African members have lined up behind Ethiopia. Basically, they've said that we agree with the Ethiopian position, this is purely a domestic affair. Now, the, this is what we heard back in the 1980s. This is what we heard when governments like Rwanda were per perpetrating genocide, when the Mengistu regime back in the 1980s was starving its own people. And it was in response to this that the Africans developed their own norms and principles and the, the United Nations adopted the responsibility to protect and so on. And it is 
desperately sad, worse than sad, to see the, these fundamental norms being, being essentially torn up today. Is there anything that the international relief organizations can do? Um, I know access is being pretty much denied, um, what I have read, um, to that region, but is there anything they can do? They, at the moment, they are reaching a million, a million and a half people, which is um, you know, a minority. Um, they are short of funds, but principally they, they are short of that key political agreement um, that is needed. And without um, a commitment by the Ethiopian government or the Eritrean government, without a withdrawal of the Eritrean forces, which is what the Biden administration and others have called for, um, without some form of, of, of agreement that the lives of these civilians, especially these, these children, should be a priority over the political objectives or the military objectives of the parties, um, the humanitarians really can do very, very little. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ambassador Shin, if I could ask you, what is Eritrea hoping to gain from their actions in, uh, in Tigray? Uh, quite frankly, I think that the, the government in Eritrea would like to use this situation to essentially crush Tigray. Um, the relationship between Tigray and, and Eritrea has been poor for a long time. And I think uh, President Isaias in, uh, in Eritrea sees this as an opportunity to perhaps even try to take the lead role uh, in this uh, Ethiopian Eritrean sort of condominium that, that is developing. But the immediate goal is, um, is to essentially um, be sure that the Tigray never becomes a, a potential threat to uh, the future of, of Eritrea. Uh, you had a lot of Tigrayan, uh, uh, excuse me, you had a lot of Eritrean refugees that were residing in Tigray region before the conflict broke out. And the first thing the Eritrean uh, forces did was to go to those uh, Eritrean refugee camps and in one case destroy it and either take back to Eritrea some of the refugees or force them to disperse around, uh, around Ethiopia, uh, which I thought was a rather telling development in terms of what Eritrea is trying to accomplish there. All right, uh, thank you. And then this question is really for both of you. The national elections that were postponed from October, 2020, will be held in a few days, uh, but not in Tigray. And what do you think the likely results will be? And will Prime Minister Abiy remain um, Prime Minister? If you, Ambassador Shin, if you want to go first. Well, sure. Uh, I'm perfectly willing to see what the outcome of the elections is going to be. Uh, there are several areas where the elections will not take place. Uh, they're going to be postponed in the Somali region. Uh, they're going to be uh, postponed apparently in some parts of Oromia, which is a very large uh, section of Ethiopia. So there are some real questions as to what all is going to be accomplished with these elections, but they're obviously going forward on the 21st and we'll see what the outcome is. The, the history of elections in Ethiopia is not a very pretty picture. As I indicated earlier, the only one that, that had uh, any real respect involved with it was the one in 2005. And even that one resulted in a great deal of violence after it was over. Uh, so I'm not terribly optimistic about the election, but uh, we'll see how they turn out. And then Alex, for the population in Tigray, um, since the, the election won't be taking place in that region, for them, there was really no, um, they have no, no way to express um, their obvious dissatisfaction, um, correct? Um, indeed, the, the, at the moment we have a situation where the, uh, the government of Ethiopia is insistent that the, the TPLF will have no future at all in, in, in any form in Ethiopia. They've declared it a terrorist organization. Um, this is a, a party that 
when the, the Tigrayans run their own elections in September 1. Um, now, we may disagree or disagree with the, 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 um, the TPLF. It may have a lot of, of, of serious questions to answer about its role in, in Ethiopia's past. But the fact is that the Tigrayans have to be consulted and it's not possible for them to be somehow bypassed. Um, what I fear is developing at the moment is a sense among the Tigrayans that this is a war of extermination waged against them. So it, the, 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 the Tigrayan sentiment really is that it, it is the Tigrayan people. And the TPLF is not really any longer a terribly relevant consideration for them. It is the Tigrayan people against the vision of the Ethiopian state of uh, Prime Minister Abiy, whom we assume will win um, next week. And um, if it is a question of one or other prevailing uh, in, 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 in a military contest, then, then I fear what we will see is that the, the, the state of Ethiopia will actually be broken on this uh, Tigray conflict. Uh, so that's an interesting statement. So you're saying the unity to, as a country, um, it could cause the fragmentation, like a permanent fragmentation? Indeed. I mean, the, the, the popular sentiment among the Tigrayans is that they, they want their independence. Now, we all know the route towards a, a, a province, a region of a country becoming independent is a very, very fraught and troubled one. It is not a, 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 stability does not lie that way. And should the Tigrayans you know, fight for this? At the moment they're not, at the moment they're fighting for self-determination, which has the theoretical option of staying within a united Ethiopia. Um, that, that is the one declared war aim that they have. But should they, should they feel that they no longer belong in Ethiopia, then it is, quite possible that very many other constituencies in Ethiopia will say, we're not part of this either. And, 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 and then we have a, a really quite scary scenario. And I, you know, Yugoslavia springs to mind as, as, uh, uh, as one example. So Ambassador Shin, can you comment on, on just what Alex was saying, how, how that would impact the other countries surrounding Ethiopia if indeed there was a, a permanent form of fragmentation? Well, of course, the, the immediate concern is the potential fragmentation of Ethiopia itself. And I've, I've argued for decades that uh, I, I thought that the Ethiopians would be able to muddle through just about any situation based on their past history. They have a very long and a very proud history and they've always managed before. And my argument has always been they will manage again. Uh, I must say I'm more concerned this time than, uh, than in any previous historical period. And there is a, a real concern that things could break apart, uh, maybe looking a little bit like Yugoslavia. I think that's a, an imperfect analogy, but there, there nevertheless is, are, are some lessons I think to be learned from the Yugoslav example. And if the Ethiopians are not careful, um, that, that kind of fragmentation could, uh, could happen. And I think in my view, that would be the worst possible outcome to what has been happening in the last uh, six, eight months in Ethiopia. The impact on the region would be equally great. Um, it, it's really hard to know how it would play out in neighboring countries, but it would not be pretty. It would not be a positive development, I'm sure. And no matter how it played out, it would probably work differently in, in different areas. Uh, but I think the, the goal here is to try to maintain, at least in, from my optic, the unity of Ethiopia. Thank you for, for that. Um, now this question is really um, for both of you. Uh, what is the impact of outside influences on the region such as China, Russia, and the United States? Uh, there was already one mention, Alex, you made about um, you know, US sanctions against what's going on to, towards Ethiopia for what's happening in Tigray. Um, so uh, I don't know if you would like to take that first, um, the impact of China, Russia, or the United States, um, uh, their influence on what is happening in Ethiopia and perhaps in Tigray. 
I think one of the reasons why this has gone so high up the agenda of, of the Biden administration, I mean, remarkably so for an African issue, it's, it, it has got a lot of very high level attention, is because the, the conflict is right next to the Red Sea. And the Red Sea is not only a, one of the world's great strategic maritime arteries, but also it's, it has become integrated into the politics of, of the Middle East. We've seen with the war in Yemen the, and the role of, of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, just how volatile this, um, th this wider region can be. And it is, it's of great interest to China, because if you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, if you like, the, the, the Red Sea is, is the buckle on the belt. And, and so the Chinese, they have a, a, they've invested heavily in Ethiopia in the past, and they have a, have, a, have a strategic interest in this area. Now, one thing that we've seen in the recent past is that actually the different um, country, the, the different world powers can collaborate in this area. And the best example here is the counter piracy initiative, Operation Atalanta, which was set up um, some 15 years or so ago, um, under, headed by the European Union, but involving amongst others, the United States, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Chinese, even the Russians collaborated in what was a, 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 a coordinated global security attempt to suppress piracy, which everybody saw as, as, as in their interests. And if it were possible for there to be a consensus too that this type of destabilization of the region is in nobody's interests, then I think there would be a coming together internationally. Um, we haven't got there yet. Um, I think privately the Chinese are, must be extremely worried but at the moment, they are just seeing this as an opportunity to sort of, you know, poke at the United States. And the weak link in the chain here, I think, is the Africans. If the, if the Africans are able to take a lead, at least in framing what a solution should look like, then it's very likely that the Chinese and the Russians would, um, um, would, would come on board. And because there's, there's really no, nobody has a strategic interest here in turning this in, into an area of, of competitive you know, proxy interference and, 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 and rivalry. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Shen. Yeah, I, I, would, I agree with, with Alex's uh, geopolitical analysis uh, and the importance that that gives to this issue for countries like the US, uh, China, and Russia. In, in the case of the United States, there's an added issue here in terms of the Biden administration, and that is the, the emphasis that the administration is giving to human rights and humanitarian issues, much more so than the Trump administration did, and its concern about what is happening in Tigray. And I think, I think the, uh, the atrocities in Tigray are driving that. It's, it's not the politics of the TPLF. Uh, the US, I think, could care less about the, the future of the TPLF, but it is very concerned about what is happening on the ground to Tigrayans in Tigray. Uh, and that is also what tends to separate it from the policies of China and Russia. Both of those countries have said, this is an internal Ethiopian issue. Uh, we don't wanna have anything to do with, uh, with what's going on in Tigray. Uh, the Chinese have offered some humanitarian assistance to Tigray, even that has been fairly tepid. Uh, they have made a great effort to stay out of the internal issue of Tigray itself. And Russia has not really been involved at all one way or the other, as far as I can tell. So you have a, a very different approach to what's happening in Tigray from the United States on the one hand and China and Russia on the other. All right, well, thank you so much for that. So now I'm gonna to turn to some questions from the participants. And the first question I have is for Alex. And it's learning lessons from the pattern of protracted regional intervention in Somalia what are the potential pathways for non-securitized response to the Tigray crisis? That's a tough one um, because <laughs> the, the, the currently all the measures that one would expect to put in place in these circumstances are being strenuously resisted or blocked. Um, the, um, 
as I, as I mentioned, the, the, the Ethiopian government is prioritizing its what it sees as its imminent military victory over TPLF, which I think is an illusion. They've, they've been saying this for months, it hasn't happened, over humanitarian action. Um, so some form of pressure is needed. And at the moment, thus far, all the United States has done is put some visa restrictions on, on senior government officials. It's also um, suspended some, some, uh, some aid. There was a suspension this time last year by the Trump administration over the, 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 the Nile Dam issue. Um, the Biden administration has kept the suspension but changed the conditions. It's no longer associated with the Nile, it's associated with the, with the, the conflict in Tigray. They're also putting pressure on the multilateral development banks the international financial institutions, um, the IMF, the World Bank, etc., and this is um, this is a tricky this is a tricky balancing act because Ethiopia is a is a poor country. It's very drought prone, and should there be, let's say, a major harvest failure across much of Ethiopia, Ethiopia will be looking for external assistance. The Ethiopian economy is in very bad shape because you, most of the the budget is being spent on the war. And the, 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 the war and other issues of insecurity are, are having a major dampening effect on, on what was an economic success story. It's becoming increasingly perilous. So that if we had a situation like 2015 with you know, 15 um, million people also in need of food assistance, um, it would be the major donors would be forced to step up. Ethiopia would not be able to handle that as it was able to and, until a, a, a few years ago. So that, that's a tricky tool to use. Another tool that, 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 that's there in the toolbox is to have individual targeted sanctions and invoke the Global Magnitsky Act and identify uh, individuals or entities that are obstructing um, humanitarian assistance or ob obstructing a response to, to, um, to the crisis in Tigray. And that could be extremely intrusive. It could be, it could freeze a lot of the, 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 the dollar transactions of Ethiopian banks, for example. And, uh, and I, um, I, that clearly is, is, is it there in the, in, in the toolbox, whether or not the Biden administration will start to use that um, or not. Um, beyond that, there, there are the securitized, the military interventions, the Kosovo type intervention, but I don't think anyone is, is contemplating that at the moment. All right, thank you. And then this question will be for uh, Ambassador Shin. It's from Sudan's ambassador to Canada. Um, how can you foresee future relations on the short term among Sudan, Ethiopia, and Eritrea with developments in the turbulent region, such as the Tigray crisis, GERD, and the border issue between Sudan and Ethiopia, and to what extent the Horn of Africa will be affected? Well, on the, the border issue between Sudan and Ethiopia, as I noted, it's a very long-standing issue, and at some point it needs to be resolved. Uh, there were efforts actually to bring that uh, issue to, a, to an end uh, during the previous government. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't quite get entirely dealt with. And there probably is a reasonable compromise that can be worked out uh, that will allow the Ethiopian farmers who have been farming that section of what Sudan claims, perhaps to continue farming there, but um, perhaps uh, come to some kind of an agreement that maybe it's not Ethiopian territory, or at least to decide where the boundary runs. That's really the key. The, the situation between uh, Sudan and Ethiopia was actually quite cordial uh, until the conflict in, um, in Tigray broke out and you had this growing dispute over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. You had pressure from Egypt on Sudan, uh, on Sudan to support the Egyptian position. And I think the Sudanese saw this to some extent as an opportunity to use the leverage of um, the, the, the water issue to uh, gain advantage on the border problem with Ethiopia. Ultimately, there is every reason for Sudan and Ethiopia to have a, 
a cordial relationship. Uh, the dam can be used to sell electricity to Sudan. It can be used to control flooding where the Blue Nile meets the White Nile in Khartoum uh, during the rainy season. If the water is controlled properly at uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, there's every reason in the world to have a cordial relationship between Sudan and Ethiopia. And quite frankly, I expect that eventually to be the outcome, but it's all gotten confused uh, in the last uh, year uh, as a result of the outbreak of conflict in Tigray and pressure by Egypt on Sudan uh, to follow its lead on what to do about the water issue. If I Alec, could jump in, yes, please. jump in here, there's, yes, please. I think a, a key factor here is Eritrea. The, um, the Eritrean leader, Isaiah Safawaki, is, is, is in, if we put dictators on a spectrum, he is right at the far end. He has, he rules a country essentially as his personal property, as his personal garrison. He has no constitution, no rule of law, no political parties, no elections, no media. Really, the only institution that functions there is, is, is the army security apparatus. And um, school leavers in Eritrea go into indefinite military service. And they are brutalized, traumatized in their training as a huge army. And the um, Abiy Ahmed won the Nobel Peace Prize for making peace with this man. But when the peace was made, you might have hoped for a liberalization, a demobilization of Eritrea. The threat had gone, but not at all. It was what it, what it, the consequence was that sanctions on Eritrea were lifted and he used those, that opportunity for rearming. So the, the, it was really not a peace agreement. It was, it was an opportunity for Isaias to, uh, for Waki, the Eritrean president to impose, try and impose his agenda. And his agenda is one which, which of really causing havoc, of keeping his own state in that particular condition, but also destabilizing not only Ethiopia, but Somalia too. He was training special forces for the Somali president in Eritrea with the aim of encouraging the Somali president to dispense with elections, to sustain himself in power, to crush um, regions of Somalia that, that wanted to retain their, their federal quasi-autonomous status. And I think one of the reasons why the, the, um, the Sudanese have, have, have been taking such a, a tough line on this is that he is also trying to destabilize Sudan. He is also arming, training and arming Sudanese opposition. He's interfering, trying to disrupt what is a, a rather um, perilous transition to a democracy and, and civilian rule in, in, in Sudan. And really, at the, uh, the, we have at the heart of this problem is this, this extremely skilled, utterly ruthless, um, rogue state, Eritrea, that is tiny, but because the entire energy and resources of the state are devoted to one agenda, which is keeping the president in power and allowing him to destabilize the region. It is a remarkably difficult actor to deal with. Thank you. Um, there's a, a follow-up question in a sense um, for both, either one of you um, or both. Uh, a commentator saying, what a sad state of affairs that African states and presumably the AU is not yet seized with the humanitarian impact of this crisis and the risk of this conflict generating the fragmentation of Ethiopia itself. What are the prospects of these positions changing? Well, very quickly on, on the role of the African Union here, it's between a rock and a hard spot in that the African Union headquarters is in Addis Ababa. Uh, it is in a very difficult position in terms of, of taking uh, certainly any action of any significance against uh, the Ethiopian government. I think it would be very reluctant to do that. Ethiopia obviously is a, an important member of the African Union. So it's one of these many cases in Africa where I don't see the African Union in a strong position to, to do much, uh, nor does it have the resources to deal with the humanitarian problem in Tigray. It's never really been able to, to deal with major humanitarian crises in Africa uh, those have been dealt with by the European Union, the United States, and, and other donor countries. 
and not the African Union. I would just add to that that the Sudanese Prime Minister, Abdallah Hamdok, in December called for a summit of the regional Northeast African states with this on the agenda. But the Ethiopian Foreign Minister and the Commissioner of the African Union, Musa Faki, um, essentially derailed that effort and, 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 and it led nowhere. So there is a, there's an awareness in, in, in some countries about the perils of what is happening, but there is not yet that, 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 that political leadership or the political clout to allow that concern to be translated into meaningful action. Okay, thank you. And then this question is for Alex from someone, um, one of our participants. And they wanted to know where you got the figure of 5 million. Um, and uh, they wanted to know if you have some um, affiliation to the TPLF. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, I've known leaders of, 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 of the TPLF and indeed other Ethiopians for, uh, for many years. My, um, my closest friends from Tigray, people who are not in TPLF who've been thrown out of TPLF or against TPLF for many years. Um, the, um, uh, so I, and, you know, I, and, 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 and there are various people who in, in Ethiopia who, for whom um, the facts um, are not acceptable and they try and, 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 and say that these facts are invented by, by, by people um, aligned with TPLF. The figures um, that I've been using are, are, are ones that come from the United Nations. Um, the, the, the United Nations figure is at the moment 5.2 million people in need of food assistance in Ethiopia, 350,000 um, in, in famine conditions. The, the UN says these figures are underestimates, especially the famine um, conditions that uh, they were not able to reach approximately 1.5 million people who live in areas under the effective control of the Tigray Defense Forces who are not receiving any, um, any assistance. And I would just add, I mean, there's an interesting sort of um, political angle here that is often missed. The leader of the Tigray Defense Forces is an Ethiopian general called Sadkan Gebertin Sai. He left TPLF 20 years ago, fierce critic of TPLF. He was an intermediary between Prime Minister Abiy and the TPLF trying to prevent this war. Um, he was highly critical of both sides. And then when the war turned from a limited operation into what he says a war against the Tigran people, he went and, and, and with a number of his, his fellow veterans from back in the 1980s, rejoined. I mean, these are men in their 60s. They're retired people walking with sticks. And um, they and, 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 and the, they are the ones who are actually mobilizing the resistance. The TPLF is, 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 is only part of this. It is essentially a, a mobilization of the, of, men, of the Tigrayan people who feel that they, they are being systematically shut out of any role in Ethiopia, that the Prime Minister sees Tigray as somehow just a, a, a bump on the road to a greater Ethiopia and that you can dispense with these five million people. And that is, 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 is quite a terrifying prospect. And that is why you know, people such as, as, as General Tsadkan, who, who is a, you know, a national figure, he's a Tigrayan, but a national figure, are now you know, the, those who are actually leading the, the, uh, the Tigrayan resistance. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have another question. While the elections this Monday are considered a foregone conclusion in terms of domestic support, support for the Prosperity Party, do any of you view any changes to the post-electoral calculus for the PP that would better allow them to finally have the political base to handle some of the domestic and regional crises such as the dam. In essence, could we see the elections allowing them to accept less politically palatable deals that could turn some of these crises, quote unquote, off? I don't know who would like to start. Silence. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll comment on it, but I, I'm not sure I have a, a very helpful response to it. Uh, first, I'm, I'm not 
totally convinced that the elections are a foregone conclusion, there may be some surprises in the election. Uh, the problem is that the, we know because of some of the areas that are not voting, that there are going to be flaws in the electoral process. So that's a given. Uh, the question is how flawed will the elections be? And if there are flaws that can be rectified in the, uh, in the short term, uh, then that's not all bad. But I don't think we really know how these elections are going to turn out. So I think a lot will, will be told in terms of the percentage of turnout, uh, how many people actually vote um, is almost as important as for whom they vote. Uh, so we could have a lot of surprises all the way around here. Uh, I, I'm not expecting a great deal uh, and on the positive side of the ledger, but I would like to be very pleasantly surprised. All right. Um, another question, is there the possibility that the border dispute between Ethiopia and Sudan affect the UN peacekeeping mission and Abay as all the forces come from Ethiopia? If yes, can this lead to conflict with South Sudan and Sudan again? Alex, would you like to take a... So there are a couple of issues here. One, one actually is uh, the issue about the status of Ethiopian forces in peacekeeping operations in general, because there is a human rights due diligence that has to be done for a country <clears throat> to, to provide troops for peacekeeping. And Ethiopia um, has been the major troop contributor to, to UN peacekeeping operations. But um, that's now under review because of the level of abuses in, in Tigray. So Ethiopia faces the scenario that Sri Lanka did some um, 13, 14 years ago, where it could be debarred from peacekeeping. So there would be no Ethiopian peacekeeping at all because the UN would simply determine that the Ethiopian army does not have a good enough human rights record. And we are headed that way very, very fast. There's a second aspect here, which is that you have Ethiopian troops of Tigrayan origin in these peacekeeping operations, some of whom have already sought asylum. So that those in a number of those in Abia have already sought asylum in Sudan. And under the current conditions, it's not likely that they will be sitting idle. It's likely that they would be recruited clandestinely or openly to into the Tigray resistance or some other um, resistance forces. So we could see this seeding of proxy conflicts. And then there's the, 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 the specific question of whether the, um, the withdrawal of, of, of the, the peacekeeping force in Abia um, would lead to conflict between Sudan and South Sudan. And I would just say one thing on that, which is that, that relations currently between Sudan and South Sudan are pretty good. Um, relations between the communities in those areas are perhaps not so good. So there is some need for peacekeeping, but probably not at the level that was um, that it was a few years ago. I, I would only add that you actually have three UN peacekeeping operations in Sudan. One is in Darfur, which is coming to an end. I believe it will shut down by the end of June. So that issue basically disappears. Uh, Alex described the situation in Abi, Abiyé, which is almost exclusively Ethiopian forces. And then you have a third uh, UN peacekeeping operation in South Sudan. And I believe there are Ethiopians that are assigned to that operation also. Uh, and the whole Tigrayan question would get into that. The other issue with that uh, South Sudan uh, issue is you have several hundred thousand South Sudanese refugees living inside Ethiopia. Uh, you actually have more uh, Sudanese refugees in Gambela region and you have res Ethiopian residents of Gambella living in Gambella. So you have a lot of issues here that come into play. Thank you so much. Um, there's another question here regarding the Ethiopian constitution. And uh, the participant wants to know about the ethnic religious points of the Ethiopian constitution and what impact this has had on the wider conflict. Mm -hmm. Alex, you you look like you might be ready to. Um, this is 
the, the this is one of the most contentious issues in Ethiopian politics. Actually, not the religious issue, but the the, the ethnic issue, because Ethiopia, as as Ambassador Shin said at the beginning, was an empire. It was. Uh, a, a, a conquest state in which a certain military, martial, feudal aristocracy over, you know, overran, conquered, subjugated other peoples. And the, the question about the equality of or the status of these different cultural, linguistic, ethnic groups in Ethiopia was one of the factors that led both to the revolution and then to the wars against the, the Marxist regime in, 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 in the 1970s and 1980s. The federal constitution of 1991, which was uh, jointly, in fact, the, 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 one of the key drafters was, was from the Aromo Liberation Front, was jointly put together by a number of groups with, with the Tigrayans at the, at the head, was an attempt to, to, to resolve this. That it has numerous problems, both in the, in, 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 in the framework and also even in, in the implementation. But opening it up again is, is in many ways um, opening a, a, a Pandora's box of, of, of um, disputes. It has to be handled with great delicacy, and it can't be handled, surely cannot be handled in the context of ongoing armed conflicts and, 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 and atrocities. There has to be a way of, of, of getting to some sort of national dialogue on the basis of, of some tolerance and, 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 and civic acceptance of the other. Thank you. Um, and I have another question here, um, and actually it's probably for Alex. Um, is there the prospect that the ongoing campaign of deliberate starvation, rape, pillaging of hospitals, et cetera, by the governments of Ethiopia and Eritrea, if it were continued, could it be considered a campaign of genocide against the Tigrayan people? There's a one word answer to that and it's yes. Okay, all right. Um, and then there's another one asking, is there a difference in the war tactics of Eritrean, Amharan, and Ethiopian forces, which has not been reported and detailed? Um, they suggest it's because they're, they're saying um, Eritrea is dismantling the decades of work and civil society. Um, you know, so this is, this is their question, um, Ambassador Shin. Yeah, you know, I, I think that there are important differences here, and, and I, I can't really comment on the, the Amhara militia. I don't know enough about them or what they're doing in, um, in the region, but there are differences between the, the Eritrean Defense Forces and the Ethiopian National Defense Force. If you look at most of the allegations of, um, of rape and of uh, sexual abuse of women, more of them seem to be attached to the Eritrean forces than the Ethiopian forces. Both are involved, but it seems to be the Eritrean forces that are more deeply involved. The, the Eritreans seem to be, the troops seem to be running pretty roughshod uh, over Tigray. And that doesn't surprise me in view of the animosity between uh, the government of Eritrea and Tigray region. If I could comment, there was a, a question in the chat box that is sort of related to this. It asked, why is the, uh, Ethiopian military, which has a reputation for being so strong, why is it calling or using the Eritrean military to help it out? And that's a very important and interesting question. I, I think there are several reasons for that. One, the Eritrean troops are closer to Tigray. They're right next door. So it's easy for them to come in and help out. Uh, it's just logistically simpler to move them into Tigray. But more importantly, I, I think that you're seeing in the Ethiopian military, particularly at the lower ranks, the same issues of ethnic division and uh, dispute and conflict that you're seeing in the rest of the country. And I think that the, the Ethiopian military today is not the military that we knew two years ago or three years ago. Uh, it's not as strong as it once was. It's not as coherent as it once was. And I think there's probably less um, uh, agreement in, in the government of Ethiopia that it is as strong as it once was. Uh, hence, this is a good time to bring in the, the Eritrean military, which is probably more united at the moment. 
Well, thank you so much for a, for a fascinating discussion. And uh, I, I wanted to thank Ambassador Shin and Professor Alex DeWall for joining us today. And Courtney, I will turn it over to you. Yes, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Um, this is, I think, a really important issue. It's actually, you know, speaking of his history, you know, the, the famine in the 80s was actually what got me interested in international affairs in, in the beginning. Um, so thank you. Uh, you know, I think these are very tough topics. So I really appreciate your 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 time today, um, and thank you, Joanna, for moderating the audience for all the terrific questions. Our next event is on Tuesday, the twenty second, um, and it's we're going to be taking a look. It's a follow up to another event we had, looking at the future of the international liberal world order, but taking a look at it from the standpoint of developing countries. Um, so please, I encourage you to RSVP. We're keeping our briefings free and open to everyone around the world for as long as we can. So you can RSVP. We also are a nonprofit. So uh, please do donate so we can keep these conversations going. Um, Ambassador Shin, Professor DeWall, thank you so much. Joanna, thank you um, for just a, a, lot of, a lot of insights today. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah.